Hello, the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, this thing that we're going to call the argument function. Um, so really we're just going to introduce the, relative, uh, the, the relevant concepts and um, try and build up an intuitive understanding for what this argument function does and also how we can describe it mathematically. So today we're going to be talking about the properties of complex functions. And so what does that mean? This is a function that takes as its input a complex number. Um, so we have a picture of the complex plane over here, and um, I'm going to give it a name as well. I'm going to call it the s-plane, and our complex function takes as its input complex numbers, and it spits out complex numbers. So it's some mapping from one copy of the complex plane to another copy of the complex plane. Over here, and we might as well give this a name as well, we call it the f-plane. Um, the important thing is that we have two complex planes and our function is a mapping from one to the other. And we want to start thinking about functions both in terms of the input space and the output space. Because uh, we're going to start inputting more than just points, we're going to input curves and into other curves and we're going to try to build up some understanding for what happens. Um, so this is what we have. We input some complex number into f of s and we get out some other complex number. Let's um, say it's over here. It could be somewhere else in the complex plane, but some complex number produces another complex number. So that's a complex function. Um, how about arguments? So very quick recap. Um, argument here is referring to arguments of complex numbers and the argument of a complex number is just the angle that it makes with the positive real axis and you measure positive arguments in the anti-clockwise direction and the normal convention is that you say a number on the positive real axis has got zero argument and as you move around anti-clockwise the argument increases and here it's pi over 2 pi and so on. So that's what the argument of a complex number is and what we're trying to get an understanding of today or define using this argument function is some idea of how much the argument of the output of a complex function changes as its input varies along some curve. So let's just draw a picture of what's going on. Rather than looking at an input point S0 we're going to instead look at some input curve that's going from S0 to, say, S1. And this curve is just a collection of points in the complex plane along with a direction. And as we move along this curve, we get different values for our output. When we start, we start at f of S0, and then depending on where we are on the curve, our output might uh, move around. Let's just say it's... Uh, something like this. So this is f of s1 and as we vary along our input curve the output of our function also moves along a curve. And what the argument function does is it tells you how much the argument of the output changes as you move along the curve. So we started with this argument here, theta, and we finished up with a complex number with this argument here. And what the argument function does is it returns the change in argument between where you started and where you finished. So this angle here, uh, this is the output of the argument function. And what are the inputs to the argument function? Well, the inputs are both the input curve, but also the function you're looking at itself. And um, the notation that's used um, for this in your notes is delta gamma arg of f. And we're not going to make any use of this notation, so it's not really um, worth uh, worrying about it too much, but what that means here is that this function takes as input a complex function f and also some uh, curve 
gamma, and it outputs the amount that the argument of the function has changed as you move along the curve. Um, so the, the, the way we name this is not really interesting, but describing this mathematically is going to be interesting, and it's, we're going to use this to derive what's called the argument principle, which then underpins all sorts of other results. So trying to build up a mathematical way to describe this change in argument, this is what we really need to focus on. Um, and so let's just draw a few more pictures to try and describe what's going on a little bit more precisely. So how do we typically define curves in the complex plane? Well, the typical way to do this is we parameterize them with respect to a real parameter, and let's call it t. Um, so in order to parameterize this curve here, what we might do is we come up with some function s of t that depends on a real number t, um, and as we vary t from one value to another, say a and b, s of t spits out a complex number that moves along this curve. So as we move from a to b, s of t produces all of the points on this um, curve. And what are we trying to describe? Well, we want to describe the change in the argument of our output. And so let's just draw a little picture um, for what's going on. So initially we see for a value of t is equal to a, so this, let's say this is s of a and s of b, and all the intermediate values of t just move us along this curve. Well, if we plot here the argument of f of s, evaluated at the points s of t for t in the range a to b, well, we start off a little bit, um, we have a slightly negative argument, and then by the end, we're finishing just above. Let's say that's an argument of pi. We're a little bit above. And our argument moves something like this, say. Um, so that's what's going on when we view the argument as a function of this parameter t. How can we now start turning this into um, a mathematical object? Well, we're interested in the change in argument, and this is very suggestive of integrals again. So we would love to come up with something, some integral for which the yeah the result of integrating gives us this. So we would love to find some function that when we integrate it, it returns the argument of f of s of t, and then we can just evaluate it for t, the, the difference between t is equal to b and t is equal to a, and this will give us the change in the argument as t moves along the curve. So now it's just a question of trying to guess what we should have. So, well, we know the limits of our integration. We have our dt. And what's going to integrate to give this? Well, it's just going to be d by dt of arg of f of s of t. Okay, we're making some progress. How can we start to turn this into something that looks a little bit like a contour integral. So you may need to revisit some of your notes on complex analysis or something like that to remind yourself of how you go about doing this. But in general, when we um, integrate along, if we want to integrate some function g of s along some contour, the way that we do that is we turn it into one of these parameterized curves and we instead integrate g of s of t, and then we have to put in a ds dt dt. So what we're really trying to do is match everything up. 
Um, so let's undo the substitution here. Um, or rather, let's uh, shove in our dsdt. And so if we do that, what do we get? Well, we have, we can have ds dt ds and now here we've got the argument of f s t so on dt and now things are basically in the right form um, and so we turn this into a normal looking contour integral and here we'd have a d by ds of the argument of f Yes, and this is actually the definition of this guy that you are given in your notes. Um, but hopefully you can start to sort of see a bit more intuitively where this is coming from. So we've got some parameterized curve and we want to have some integral that's evaluating the difference between the argument at the two extremes of the curve. And okay, we have some definition now. It's still not particularly useful. Um, what we really want to do is turn this, we just want to massage it a little bit further and we're going to turn it into some more familiar functions. So we've got the argument of some complex number f. And if you think back to polar representations, there's a very clean way of getting the argument of a complex number out. Um, I'm running out of space a little bit. But basically, if, if I have a general complex number, r e to the i theta, and I'm interested in its argument, one way to get, get at that is to take the natural log of this. And so what do I get here? Well, I get log r plus i theta. So then I see if I took the imaginary part, and I took the imaginary part here, then I would just get theta. And so that the punchline of this is that the imaginary part of the log of a complex number is just equal to its argument. So we can say arg of f is equal to the imaginary part of the log of f. And it takes a little bit of convincing, but you can convince yourself that actually I can move this imaginary part through the integral. And if I do that, this simplifies a little bit, and I would be left with the imaginary part of d by ds of the logarithm of f. And what's now if I just differentiate log of f of s with respect to s, I get, yeah, f dash, f dash means df. Um, differentiate the function f with respect to s all over f of s ds. And it's this um, contour integral here that's typically actually used to define um, the, the change in the argument. Um, and this is what we're going to be using in the next lecture, so maybe I can draw a box around it. But Anyway, there we have a very quick introduction to the argument of a function. In summary, the argument, sorry, very quick, quick introduction to the argument function. And what the argument function does is it takes as input some curve and some function, and it tries to tell you how much the argument of that function changes as your input moves along the curve. And here we have a nice, convenient um, description that's written in terms of some contour integral and basic properties of the function f, so in particular the ratio of its derivative over the function itself. And it's uh, this that we're going to use to um, uh, derive the argument principle which comes next.